حابين نعمل هالسيشن المنوع من مبدا من كل بستان زهره نحن كان عندنا اقسام اماميه وجلوكوما وبيدياتريك وريتينا أه حنبلش مباشره مع الدكتور امين مرعشي اتش تي ليزر ابلكيشن فور دي ام اي مانجمنت تفضل دكتور امين نعم سكرين شير ستارت برودكاست ظهر عندكم السلايد نعم اوكي ظاهر اوكي هلو ايفربادي ماي نيم از دكتور Dr. Amin Marashi, I'm Retina Specialist in Marashi Eye Clinic. Uh, today I'm going to present the Hyper Threshold Laser for Diabetic Macular Edema. I have no financial interest in products mentioned in this presentation. The objective uh, of this presentation is uh, to demonstrate a new laser treatment protocol developed by me for certain cases of diabetic macular edema, which uses microsecond laser technology using a hybrid of both threshold and sub-threshold power using 532 nanometer diode laser to increase the efficacy of laser treatment. I, induct, I conducted study that uh, had the purpose to determine if hyperthreshold laser can reduce macular thickness in diabetic macular edema and to determine if this method can stabilize vision. Uh, I enrolled 12 eyes in 10 patients diagnosed with a diabetic macular edema using spectral domain OCT treated with hyperthreshold laser. The leaking microaneurysm were treated with threshold laser uh, on a setting of 5% duty cycle, 500 uh, microns new to the fuzz uh, area and 15 duty cycle to an area far from fuzz. Then sub-threshold uh, microsecond laser applied in a painting fashion, no spacing between laser spots uh, to uh, the area of edema as identified by spectral domain OCT with a setting of 5% UT cycle, 500 microns near to fuzz area and 15% UT cycle to an area far from fuzz. This is the patient characteristics. Um, the settings where uh, I put uh, 600 milliwatt, uh, the power 0.2 second interval duration and switch on the microsecond uh, laser technology, which I put 5% UT cycle. That means the uh, laser will work only for 100 microsecond and will uh, switch up for 1,900 uh, microsecond. And I start to add or subtract power to achieve threshold reaction on the retina and then treat all uh, the leaking microaneurysms as identified by fluorescein angiogram. Uh, after a treatment of all uh, laser, uh, all uh, the leaking microaneurysms, I, uh, I chopped the power uh, into half. Uh, if I had 600 milliwatt to achieve a threshold laser, then I will uh, uh, use 300 milliwatts uh, to, as a sub-threshold power to treat all area of uh, the edema as identified uh, by spectral domain OCT uh, in a painting fashion. Uh, the follow-up was a complete uh, fund monthly fundus exam, including vascular visual equity and monthly measuring retinal thickness using spectral domain OCD for 24 weeks follow-up. The results were I, I achieved a reduction of, of retinal thickness from uh, 336 uh, microns to 600, uh, to, sorry, to 264 microns at uh, 24 weeks uh, follow-up. No, uh, no significant changes in vascular visual equity. There was a minimal scar formation in 24 weeks follow-up. This is how the uh, macular thickness uh, behaved and changed uh, during the 24 weeks follow-up. Uh, I'm going to take one case uh, from the study, a 53 years old male pekic, best corrected visual equity is 2020, known to be diabetic. Pontus exam shows no such diabetic macular edema with moderate MPDR. This is Pontus exam and early angiogram, and uh, where I put the uh, yellow uh, excess, where I applied the threshold uh, laser to the leaking microorganism. Here I used 15% uh, duty cycle, and where the uh, orange circles, how I applied the sub threshold uh, microsecond laser in a painting fashion covering all area of edema as identified by spectral domain uh, OCD. As we look uh, closer, there is a small area of leakage and uh, the same area depicted as a, a, a macular edema uh, near to the fuzz. So I switched to 5% duty cycle uh, with a sub-threshold microsecond laser covering this area. Uh, this is how a retinal burn looks. And this is how the threshold laser looks. I just made this 
just to uh, let you see uh, the difference between both of them. This is how uh, it looked 24 hours post treatment, and this is how the retina scars are using a, a, a threshold a microsecond laser. And this, sorry, so using microsecond laser, uh, the uh, retina scar, and uh, this is how the uh, threshold laser scar looks after 24 uh, weeks post treatment. This is uh, the OCT uh, showing uh, the uh, macular edema, and we can see the post uh, in four weeks post HD laser, there is a retinal scar. However, this scar didn't expand and, or change in a 24 weeks follow up and I achieved stabilization and reduction of uh, retinal thickness. Uh, as I noticed that this HD laser is uh, doing a great job, so I started to test it on more serious uh, macular edema. This is a, a 42 years old male fake kick with best corrected visual acuity is 2032, known to be diabetic. And he had a uh, issue uh, where he had a high risk to development of uh, myocardial infarction as uh, reported by his cardiologist. So the Pontus exam shows central diabetic macular edema with high risk uh, proliferative diabetic coronopathy. And his Pontus exam shows uh, NVD, NVE with minute vitreous hemorrhage with um, some uh, uh, panretinal laser uh, application, and his uh, early angiogram shows an uh, early leakage from the uh, from sorry from the new vascularization uh, uh, elsewhere and on the disc, along with enlarged fuzz and uh, uh, area of hypoperfusion temporal to the macula. Uh, I here I applied a combined treatment of HD laser, as seen here in the uh, depicted in the X. Uh, this is where I applied the uh, on the leaking microbiome reserves, and here uh, where I applied uh, the uh, sub threshold microsecond uh, laser. Here I only used um, a five percent UT cycle because of, the, of enlarged fuzz, and I avoided uh, the foveal evascular zone while uh, uh, using laser. In addition, I applied uh, pan uh, the conventional panretinal uh, laser uh, uh, co co photocoagulation to treat uh, the proliferation uh, and covering all area of edema, including the uh, temporal area. Let's look at the OCT. There is a hyperreflective dots uh, on the in the vitreous. Um, uh, they are uh, uh, the uh, heme, uh, they are resembling a heme. We see there's an increased retinal thickness uh, with cystic uh, changes. Uh, after 24 weeks uh, follow up, we see the resolution of heme because of the PRP application and reduction of central macular thickness uh, due to the HD laser with uh, a decrease in size of the cyst. This is how the fundus looked uh, post treatment. We can clearly see where I applied the PRP, and here are, I don't know if it's uh, clear to you where. I, laser scars were applied. They are too minimal and they don't spread the fovea uh, by any means. And there is, a, of course, a result of the vitreous hemorrhage and regression of the um, new vascularization. Uh, this is another case of 59 years old fake glaucoma patient had endophthalmitis due to intravitreal injection of pivacizumab as successfully treated with intravitreal antibiotics. Patient complained from reduction of vision 20 and OCT shows increased central macular thickness with subretinal fluids. Patient scheduled for HD laser with 5% UT cycle and uh, within 24 weeks of treatment, vision improved to 2040 with significant reduction of central macular thickness. As we've seen here, there is uh, increased retinal thickness with intraretinal subretinal fluids and intraretinal heart exudates. For 24 weeks post treatment, we see a complete resolution of the uh, intra and subretinal fluids with reduction of uh, macular thickness. This is the last case I'm gonna say, talk about today. Here is a, um, a patient with baseline 64, two years old phakic, had central diabetic macular edema, treated with four consecutive injection of anti-VGF. Patient uh, had improved vision from 2040 to 2025 with residual non-central diabetic macular edema. And patient uh, scheduled for HD laser with 5% UT cycle. And within two months of treatment, the vision remained stable with the reduction of macular uh, edema, reducing the need of intra uh, vitriol injection as depicted with a laser pointer. In conclusion, a 532 nanometer hyper threshold laser reduced macular thickness up to 20% and stabilized the diabetic macular edema for 24 weeks. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Amin. So on behalf of Dr. Ramez, I'm going to invite the second speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Nuhal Fayoumi uh, to present refractive surgery and glaucoma. Please, Dr. Nuhal.
Dr. Anuha, uh, you are mute. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's okay. But um, I cannot start. Dr. Anas Sarmana, hello, come on. Here, because the other participant is sharing, yeah. Now you can share, Dr. Yeah. You can share slides. Yeah. We can see your slides. Okay, good. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, it gave me a great pleasure to be here with you in this great uh, meeting this evening. My talk today is about deep sclerectomy and its importance in glaucoma surgery. As you know, the management of glaucoma requires chronic treatments with spectrum of therapeutic options, including drugs, laser treatment, incisional filtration surgery, maybe drainage, and many types of surgical implants. Deep sclerectomy is a non-penetrating procedure for a treatment of an uh, open angle uh, glaucoma. In the last few years, Deep sclerectomy has gained importance in glaucoma surgical treatment in contrast to trabeculectomy and it has aqueous homer drainage outflow without entering the anterior chamber and thus reducing the incidence of intra and postoperative complications. Glaucoma surgery is rarely curative and it's usually replaced one problem for another. And the goal of the glaucoma surgery only is to lower intraocular pressure. Unfortunately, the surgeon who performed a glaucoma surgery like a trabeculectomy had a sadly surprised the day after performing the surgery, uh, maybe uh, uh, soft and um, uh, painful eyeball, maybe collapse in the atrial chamber, some bleeding, uh, choroidal detachment, tendency to develop cataract. And for this reason, I want to focus on the non-penetrating procedures. In glaucomatis eye, the conventional outflow canals are obstructed and filtering surgery in current approach has sought to relieve IOP by passing the presumed obstruction. We always research about the ideal glaucoma surgery that you are not going to make a hole in the eye like trabeculectomy, and you want to create a mechanism for tapping into the system that God gave us. As effective as trabeculectomy, but more safe, no clip, easy to perform, less post-operative effort, and inexpensive. Globally, the next step is, as you know, is mix. I want to focus on non-penetrating deep sclerectomy, and it's one of the mix, and not as expensive as a mix, and also it's affordable. It may be more difficult and more demanding and need more practice with the true knowledge to anatomical futures, but I think it's a very excellent option if you gain the skill to do this procedure. Deep sclerectomy is a bad name for a good surgery. Why? Because peeling off the external trabecular of the inner wall of the Schlimms canal to obtain a good filtration is essential vase. Thus, the technique is more appropriately described as a non-penetrating external trabeculectomy and not deep sclerectomy. Also, it's widely accepted that the deep sclerectomy is more safe but remains some controversy about the intraocular pressure lowering effects. And the most failures occurred within the first year after surgery for insufficient filtration, subconjunctival fibrosis, and the most significant things is the fibrosis of the internal portion of the trabecular. Avoid secondary collapse of the superficial flap over the trabecular dissemi membrane Metomycin, say, and many types of implants can be placed in scleral bed like SK gel, collagen, hyaluronic acid, hema, and stopper. I want to speak about my experience in experience in stopper eclip. This is, is non-reabsorbable implants with objective 
maximize all aqueous humor drainage pathway. This is short video to show you the technique. First, we exposure the eye pole by put, put suturing in the adalimbus, then opening the conjunctival adalimbus also. Superficial flap with thickness equal to one third of the sclera. And we have to dissect it two millimeters into clear cornea to uh, allow to good exposure of the decime, uh, trabeculodecimatic plane. Deep flap identified by the dark color of underlying choroid and then identification for very important landmark, the sclera spore, pearly and shiny fibers with uh, oriented to uh, and concentrically to the limbus. Then peeling off, this is the essential phase, peeling off the inner endothelium of the Schlimm canals and just a canunicular trabeculum. Then resection the deep flap, and we have to make cut in the scleral bed, two millimeters behind the sclera spore, and dissected uh, the sopra choroidal space to put the implants. A stopper eclipse in this shape has two plates. I will place the first one under the sclera above the choroid. And as you see, it has two lateral notches. And this is good for prevent the uh, anterior displacement. Uh, so it's not necessary to fix this implant with a suturing. Then I fold the other plate and close the sclera and this is helping to keep the uh, scleral lips apart. Of course, close the conjunctiva. In anterior segment OCT, we have to show the HEMA implants, the intrascleral and the sopracroidal space. Also, in the UPM intrascleral PLIP and con sub, uh, subconjunctival PLIP with UV scleral outflow. At the end, non penetrating deep sclerectomy can be considered as a primary line of treatment for primary open angular coma and sometimes it replaced for the treatment, uh, the medical treatment, and also for me, it's in initial choice for primary congenital glaucoma with lesser complications. The new acrylic non-reabsorbable implants is not perceived as a implant with promising results. Nevertheless, further prospective studies are needed. Lower IOP level significantly correlated with that implant as a space maintainer and lead to aqueous hammer drainage to supracroidal, suprascleral, intraconjunctival space as suggested by images of anterior segment OCT. And don't forget that trabeculectomy is always there to take care of the failure cases. This is my references. Thank you for having me with all love from Damascus. Thank you, Dr. Anuha. You are on time. Thank you. Uh, we are glaucoma, Zara. Right now, Dr. Basil Fauri, modified trabeculectomy, and express shunt.
دكتور باسل تفضل دكتور باسل معك دكتور رامز ثواني بس تفضل وين دكتور انس انت معنا هلا صرت صورتك واضحه دكتور انس عم تسمعنا دكتور انس؟ ما عم اسمعنا Good evening. My voice heard. Yeah, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much again to be with you in this uh, wonderful meeting. Uh, my talk will be today about uh, modified therapeutic colectomy. Uh, as we all know, still uh, glaucoma is the second leading cause of uh, uh, blindness uh, worldwide. Uh, in 2010, 60 million uh, when uh, uh, has a, have a glaucoma uh, and uh, expected uh, this number to be raised for 78 million on 2020. Uh, so. Uh, management of a glaucoma uh, still uh, need uh, to be uh, uh, effective uh, to prevent the blindness for this huge number of uh, patients uh, who have uh, glaucoma. Uh, for medications, which is the first line of uh, treatment usually, we have to know that uh, the quality of life, the cost, the compliance, uh, the side effects, will uh, be uh, always against the treatment. Uh, future surgery success rate may be uh, lower. So uh, always we have to uh, put in our minds that uh, glaucoma is still a surgical disease. Uh, the five-year follow-up optic disc findings of the collaborative initial glaucoma treatment study uh, shows that glaucomatous optic disc progression higher in patient on medical treatment than surgical patients. So in use since the mid 60s, uh, trapeculectomy, non-penetrating glaucoma surgery, tube shunts uh, were available now in the 21th century, trapeculectomy or uh, express tubes, laser, trapeculoplasty, transclural laser, canaloplasty, mix, all are available now but trapeculectomy is still the gold standard and the most effective glaucoma surgery in the term of intraocular pressure reduction. But it's not improved as cataract surgery. Cataract surgery developed from intracapsular to extracapsular, then FECO and now laser FECO machines are available. The incisions in cataract surgery also from large to medium, small, now micro incisions. Uh, the uh, optical uh, recovery or optical uh, uh, implants in cataract uh, surgery. First, uh, in intracapsular cataract, we are putting glasses, then uh, we are replacing them by PMMA IOLs, then foldable lenses. Yet, foldable lenses um, uh, developed from monofocal to multifocal and toric uh, lenses now, or intraocular lenses now. But what about glaucoma surgery and the trapeculectomy? The main improvement or the vein development in this surgery happened after express uh, shunt device uh, uh, available now in the market and uh, we can apply for our patients. This is the implant. Indeed, it is uh, a stainless steel uh, implant just 2.6 millimeter in length 
uh, provided with a uh, beveled tip will be inserted in the anterior chamber. Uh, two uh, important uh, parts are the spar and the pack uh, plate. Uh, the spar will prevent the uh, implant from extrusion and the pack plate will prevent uh, intrusion. Uh, two uh, important or two main uh, types uh, were available, the Express R and the Express P. The Express P still uh, available now, Express R not uh, available more. Uh, uh, the um, main uh, thing or the um, very, very uh, important thing in this implant is the lumen. The lumen uh, of uh, 50 micron uh, will regulate the outflow of the aqueous from the anterior chamber to a uh, subsecleral flap. Uh, and uh, 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 we have two lumens in, indeed, the main uh, and uh, one uh, side uh, port lumen. The surgical indications uh, for uh, this uh, device is uh, for open angle glaucoma, glaucoma mainly, but we can do it for narrow angles uh, also. Uh, uh, just uh, to uh, avoid the peripheral anterior sinica if they are present. Uh, the implantation of uh, the express shunt may be combined with uh, uh, cataract surgery also. It's important to determine the preoperative status mobility of the conjunctiva, uh, the, uh, the healthy of the sclera, uh, and uh, to uh, determine the site of the surgery. Gonioscopy should be uh, done for evaluate the anterior chamber angle uh, for peripheral anterior sinica at the planet insertion site. The crystalline lens should also be evaluated for the possibility of cataract, which can be treated with the combined uh, surgery with uh, Express. Uh, of course, uh, we have a first, uh, 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 after doing the uh, scleral flap uh, to determine the main uh, surgical sites for us, to uh, the cornea, the blue zone, scleral spore, and sclera. All uh, glaucoma surgeons familiar with these uh, important landmarks. This is the implant here shown, uh, carried by the uh, uh, holder, uh, and uh, it's inserted uh, through a tunnel uh, uh, created by a 25-gauge uh, needle, the same as uh, tubes, Ahmed valve or Moltino. Uh, usually it inserted horizontally after the insertion, we rotate it 90 degrees vertically. After that, we are closing the sclera. The most important thing after the insertion that the, this uh, implant should be uh, parallel to the iris plan and away from it and from the uh, endothelium of the cornea. Uh, it is a video for this uh, procedure. Uh, quickly, we will come uh, over the most important steps after uh, conjunctiva uh, dissection. We are uh, doing the flap four by four millimeters. Uh, we uh, doing the flap. We can apply mitomycin, the same as it in uh, traditional trapeculectomy or deep sclerectomy. Doing side port and filling the anterior chamber with the uh, uh, viscoelastic material. Here we are carrying a 25 gauge needle. We have to insert the implant in uh, anterior of the uh, scleral spore. Uh, the entrance is very important to be uh, to do a tunnel uh, parallel to the iris and to enter the anterior chamber. We have to see the needle within the anterior chamber. Exactly like this. This is the implant.
it should be inserted horizontally after that rotate it 90 degrees then we can release the implant from the injector It is the implant now in the correct site. The rest of the surgery is the same as traditional trapeculectomy, suturing the scleral flap, then the conjunctiva. So, The post-operative consideration, uh, the same as trapeculectomy, hypotony remains a potential complication. Uh, this may be caused by flow around the implant sometimes, or loose sutures. Elevated post-operative IOP may in the, this uh, because of occlusion of the lumen of the device sometimes, or uh, fibrosis, uh, and the rest of the complication the same as trapeculectomy. But for express. Uh, when we compare by traditional or regular trapeculectomy, uh, there is no uh, sicleretomy, no peripheral iridotomy. The 50 micron lumen uh, gently uh, filtrate the aqueous uh, to plep site. Uh, very uh, little shallow, shallowing of the anterior chamber, so it's safe. No tissue taken, thus less inflammation. Quick uh, visual recovery, create a low diffuse posterior plip. It, it, is a plip. it is a very important point that the plip in this device will be posterior. I think we lost the connection with the Dr. Bastil. Away from the impulse and... Okay. Uh, now, now return back. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Bastil. Do you hear us, Dr. Bastil? Dr. Bastil, uh, unmute, unmute. إيم لميوت من عندك تحاطة ميوت. أوكي. أوكي. Can I continue now? Yeah, yeah, please. أوكي. But you uh, بيا لك دقيقتين أو ثلاث دقايق. I finished. Yeah. Almost finished. So to maximize surgical outcomes with the express shunt, correct placement is a key success point. Keep anterior chamber formed prior to insertion. This will help to insert the uh, implant correctly. Conjectival closure must be watertight. Patient selection, we have to uh, first uh, choose uh, the patient who carry uh, the higher uh, success rate. Uh, pseudophagic patients with healthy superior conjunctiva, patients with deep anterior chamber, patients with failed trapeculectomy. To avoid patients with uh, uh, angle closure or new vascular glaucoma, uveitis, or superior peripheral anterior synechia. In conclusion, express shunt device provides an alternative to conventional trapeculectomy and appears to have a similar IOP, IOP lowering effect uh, with a possible improved safety profile and uh, improved intraoperative control and uh, pred predictability in patients who are being considered for a trapeculectomy with or without a fecal emulsification. Consideration should be made for the express shunt. Expre uh, expert surgeons will not find significant difference between traditional trap and express shunt, but for beginners, express shunt may be easier and need shorter learning curve. Thank you all. Uh, happy to be you, uh, with you uh, again from uh, Damascus in this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Basel. Very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, first, I am sorry for delay because it was a small problem with the internet. Uh, 
Uh, I want to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Samer Hajjo. Uh, he will tell us about updating our knowledge regarding ocular movement uh, physiology. Dr. Samer, do you hear us? Yeah. Fadal. Okay. Uh, you hear me? Yes, Dr. Samer, you can start. <laughs> I don't see myself. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, updating our knowledge. Nam nam, I'm not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. Updating our knowledge uh, regarding ocular movement physiology. Uh, Shillington Law uh, 1894. Hearing Law 1868, Listing Law 1855, very ancient uh, uh, rules, but question that can't be solved by all theories. How can brainstem control prevent any undesired torsions and muscle slitting and keep Listing Law in tertiary high positions? It's, it's not only related to the position itself, but also to the pass for reaching it. Uh, there must be very accurate and complicated uh, brainstem control. And there must be an accurate memory for every uh, point of gas in the space. But neurologic studies reveal that such very complicated control uh, in brain stem is not expected, and there must be uh, something in downstream function for uh, organization this uh, very complicated movement. There must be uh, a function, downstream function at the level of the orbit. There is three important factors in downstream control of eye, eye movements the role of connective tissue surrounding the tendon of the muscles, passive Boley theory by Miller 1989, and active Boley hypothesis of the ash by Joseph de Marcin's year 2000. Um, the uh, connective tissue surrounding the tendon will partially reserve muscle path and prevent large sliding as shown in the picture. Uh, but Miller found that there is a, a, a true uh, boulet or uh, trochea or boulet for every rectus muscle. Every rectus muscle has its own boulet that uh, is, consists of collagen, elastin, and the smooth muscles and located directly behind the equator. This boulet will play a role of hanging system system for uh, preventing uh, any sliding, any, any undesired sliding of the muscle uh, in tertiary eye movements, uh, as shown in this picture. But uh, Dimer go more far uh, in understanding the function of the rectus muscle pulley. Uh, he discovered that the orbital layer of every rectus muscle will be inserted directly at the pulle and does not continue to the sclera as the global layer of the muscle. These uh, MRI pictures uh, show the, the insertion, the insertion of the orbital layer of the rectus muscle on the pulle. Uh, this is the insertion and this is the boulet. Uh, also, historical studies show uh, uh, such results. 
but what what this means what uh, what is the function of this insertion on tabulae as demetic this is a very important thing in the regulation of uh, eye movement or, or in the downstream regulation of, of eye movement uh, the insertion of the uh, orbital layer on the boulet will pull the boulet back uh, backward when the muscle contracts uh, and this pulling will make will keep the somewhat steady distance between the insertion uh, on the sclera and the virtual air origin, uh, which is the, the, the boulet. The boulet uh, resembles a virtual origin of, of the muscle. And when it's pulling backward, uh, when muscle contracts, this will keep the distance between this virtual origin and uh, the insertion as a sclera steady when, when I move, when I move in the, the field of action of the muscle. And this is very important uh, thing in the regulation of eye movement um, because it will uh, it will uh, reserve the the uh, relation between the muscle contraction and eye movement as linear relation. Every every uh, degree of muscle contraction will cause the same degree of eye rotation. This is as dimmer thing, but it still needs uh, more evidences and studies. Dimmer also suggests a surgery on the boulet. Uh, this is a surgery on uh, medial rectus boulet. This is isolation, uh, the isolation of the boulet and then fixing it on the sclera uh, for reducing the accommodative conversions. This is the boulet of the media rectus. Question about other possible clinical implication for uh, rectus muscle boulet. Can boulet abnormalities primary A and V pattern can boulet injuries during violent strabismus surgery be responsible for some unexpected results? Can we do other boulet surgeries? And the more important is the implications on vertical eye movement. And this is uh, really is uh, poorly discussed in literature, despite, despite of its great importance. Uh, this diagram uh, shows the uh, classic uh, traditional concepts of vertical movement dynamics, which all of you know it, know it, uh, that uh, this says that the vertical uh, rectus muscles will lose its action when the eye in abduction, uh, will lose its vertical action. Uh, superior uh, rectus will not elevate the eye in abduction and uh, inferior rectus will not uh, depress the eye in abduction uh, because because the uh, angle between uh, there there will be a rectangular uh, relation between the muscle and the visual axis and in the same way, oblique muscles will not uh, do its vertical action in abduction. But this theory, this old theory, which we have accepted since tens of years, <laughs> seems really naive and somewhat funny theory <laughs> because it supposes that the muscles will stay in place while the globe rotate. The vertical muscles will stay in place while the eye rotate very, uh, horizontally. And as they are fixing by a bush pin, I call this theory bush pin theory. 
the eye move horizontally and the muscles stay in place. This is, this is it's really impossible. As shown in picture number one, the eye in adduction and the uh, uh, superior rectus still in the same position. And this is very impossible. The picture number two um, shows that the insertion of the superior rectus will rotate with the, with the eye, but the muscle will stay in place. Just its insertion will, will move with the, with the eye. But this is, this is not impossible, but it's very unexpected and unexpected. It's, it's very unexpected uh, because of the connection between the, the tendon and the surrounding tissue, and because of the rectus muscle pole, which we had speak uh, about it before. Then this is not uh, this is not impossible, but it's really unexpected. The third picture, in, indeed, is the real picture that it showed that the tendon of, of the muscle uh, the, that is anterior to the pole will move with, uh, totally with the eye and the posterior uh, portion of the uh, uh, muscle will, will stay in, in place, but the anterior portion will move with the eye. This is the uh, uh, truth. This is the real picture of abduction. Two minutes, please. OK, OK. Um, the, there is a very important message message I will uh, give in this uh, presentation. That superior rectus is, is the main elevator in both ad abduction and abduction. And the inferior rectus is the main depressor in both abduction and abduction. In abduction, oblique muscles will compensate for the possible decrease of the activity of the vertical rectus. Uh, and will prevent undesired torsion and preserve the poor vertical function of the vertical rectus. It, uh, then the oblique muscle is accessory muscle in elevation or in depression. The, uh, the main elevator is the superior rectus and the main depressor is the inferior rectus, even in abduction. This is a, a very important message. Uh, that I want to say. Thank you all for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Samer. It is a very interesting lecture. Uh, now I uh, want to introduce uh, Dr. Mazin. Do you hear us, Dr. Mazin? Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mazin will speak. Uh, uh, the new algorithm for best IOL selection. Uh, Dr. Samer, please stop sharing your screen. So I will oh, be sorry. able to Thank you. Yeah, you can start. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. we can. Now, okay, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Now, uh, uh, I'll talk about uh, my practical subjective IOL selection algorithm or the PSIS, uh, which I developed in order to select uh, the best uh, um, IOL uh, in cataract surgery and in refractive lens exchange. Now, uh, as we know that the cornea has an aspherical shape, usually it is prolate, which means that uh, um, uh, it is not a sphere. Now we can um, uh, classify the spherical aberrations into no spherical aberration, as you see in the middle, and tol tolerable uh, spherical aberration, which extends between zero and uh, 0 0.35 in the plus and minus directions. Um, Non-toxic uh, spherical aberration, uh, which is in the green zone between uh, 0 0.35 to 0 0.6 uh, microns in both directions, and the toxic, which is more than 0 0.6 microns in both directions. Um, when, when the spherical aberration is positive, um, uh, has plus, I mean, it is positive spherical aberration and vice versa. Now, 
where our cornea is. Uh, actually, it is in the, um, sorry. Yeah, our cornea is in this uh, range. Uh, it ranges between zero to uh, almost 0 0.55 microns plus in the plus direction. So our human cornea has positive spherical aberration. Um, there is a correlation between the spherical aberration and the uh, quality of vision. Uh, the more the spherical aberration, the less the uh, quality of vision or the lower the contrast sensitivity. And there is a correlation as well between the spherical aberration and depth of focus because uh, the more the spherical aberration, the more the depth of focus, uh, which means that the patient can see near objects better um, uh, with a, a better range of movement uh, with the same amount of accommodation. But this is to some extent because uh, the spherical aberration should, ex uh, should not extend more than the non-toxic. Otherwise, uh, there will be no depth of focus. Now, um, we have to know that uh, laser vision correction, laser-based um, refractive surgery affects uh, the spherical aberration of the human cornea because the myopic treatment will make it more positive while the hyperopic treatment will make it, at, uh, will push it towards the uh, negative. Uh, as we know that uh, there are three types of the intraocular lenses that uh, we implant during the cataract surgery or uh, in the uh, lens-based refractive surgery, um, uh, particularly the clear lens extraction and uh, premium uh, and uh, uh, IOL uh, implantation. Uh, these three types are spheric, with, which is the old one, and the aspheric, and the premium lenses. Um, for the spheric, it provides by default positive spherical aberration, which is around plus 0 0.15 microns. The aspheric IOL, there are three types of the aspheric IOLs in the market. It is not only one type. So whenever we order an aspheric IOL, we have to be sure which type we are ordering. Uh, there are aspheric IOLs that provide zero spherical aberration. Uh, other types, uh, they are providing negative spherical aberration, which is minus 0 0.20 microns. And the type that provides minus 0 0.27 microns. This is regardless of the power of the lens. We are not talking about the power, we are talking about the spherical aberration that this type of lenses induce. Premium IOL. The premium IOL, we all know that. Um, the premium IOL were developed in order to extend uh, the um, uh, depth of focus and uh, to uh, let the patient see the near and intermediate uh, distances better. Um, they are the multifocal, the trifocal, and the EDOF, the extended depth of focus. For this algorithm, uh, the, um, uh, it depends actually on three factors. The amount and type of the high order aberrations, the amount and type of the spherical aberration, and on patient's demands, whether the patient prefers to have depth of focus so he can see or she can see um, clear near uh, objects uh, without uh, the uh, assistance of, uh, of glasses. Uh, but this will be, will be on account of uh, quality of vision. So the depth of focus, uh, if there is depth of focus, the quality of vision will be low. Or maybe the patient will say, no, I want sharp vision and no problem for me if I use glasses. Uh, so the patient doesn't like to have depth of focus and uh, he insists of, uh, on having uh, quality of vision. Uh, the pillars of the, uh, this uh, algorithm are, first of all, we have to know that premium IOLs are precious, which means that if the, the, the eye has high order aberrations out of the normal range, out of the a neural adaptation of the brain, then the premium IOLs cannot be implanted because if we implant those IOLs, then the patient will suffer from dysphotopsia, uh, which may be disabling and um, uh, may lead to extraction of the premium IOL. The second thing, we, uh, always when we face a toxic spherical aberration, we can convert it into non-toxic. 
spherical aberration by uh, implanting those lenses. So we have to pay attention to the spherical aberration that the patient has. According to that, we can decide whether to maintain the non-toxic um, uh, spherical aberration or uh, to push the toxic spherical aberration to be non-toxic spherical aberration. And if the patient insists of, uh, on quality of vision, then we have to uh, compensate for and neutralize the non-toxic in order to be as close as to plus 0 0.1 microns uh, in order to get the sharp vision. So these are the general rules that uh, we use when we apply this uh, PSIS uh, algorithm. So uh, according to the high order aberrations in the cornea of the patient, why in the cornea, not the ocular? Because we are talking about cataract surgery where we are going to remove the lens and we are talking about clear lens extraction where we are going to remove the lens and we are putting a new lens in the eye. So the, the element that affects the decision is the cornea. So the high order aberrations of the cornea, whether it is normal, so the RMS is within 0 0.35 microns, abnormal, if the RMS is more than 0 0.35 microns, but on account of spherical ab uh, aberration, or it is abnormal RMS, more than 0 0.35 microns, but on account of other high order aberrations such as coma and trefoil. So according to the um, amount and type of the high order aberrations, we can go to pathway one, normal, pathway two, abnormal, uh, but spherical aberration, or uh, uh, the third one, which is abnormal, but on account of other high order aberrations. Starting with the first pathway, if the, uh, the, the cornea has normal high order aberrations, then if the patient cares about depth of focus, then of course we can implant premium IOL, which gives the patient the three uh, distances. Uh, if the image quality is critical to the patient, then we have to implant uh, negative spherical aberration or zero spherical aberration. Why negative? Because as I said before, the cornea induces, the normal cornea induces a positive spherical aberration. So we are neutralizing this negative spherical aberration or maintaining it if it is as close as possible to the 0 0.1 microns, because this is the um, target spherical aberration that gives the sharpest vision. We will give some examples. If the pre-op corneal spherical aberration was plus 0 0.35, we can implant the minus 0 0.27 microns spherical, uh, aspheric, sorry, aspherical IOL in order to get uh, post-op ocular spherical aberration, which is um, as close as to the uh, plus 0 0.1 uh, uh, microns. Another example, pre-op uh, plus 0 0.30, uh, implanting minus 0 0.20 uh, IOL, then we will get the target. If it was plus 0 0.20, then we can implant minus 0 0.20 in order to get um, uh, uh, zero micron of spherical ab aberration. Uh, if it was plus 0 0.17 micron, we can uh, implant the zero spherical aberration to, to maintain it, or we can neutralize it and we may induce, in, induce uh, just a little bit of uh, ocular, uh, minus ocular spherical aberration. And uh, this is the last example, which is plus 0 0.12 microns preoperatively. Uh, we, we should maintain it because it is very close to the target. Uh, we come to the uh, third pathway, which is the abnormal RMS on uh, account of other high order aberrations. In this case, we must not play with the spherical aberration. We must not play with the high order aberrations of the patient because if we play with the spherical aberration, we are going to induce more high order aberrations and um, part of which may be native and we are changing the native high order aberrations and the patient will suffer from dysphotopsia. So the best way, um, the best uh, uh, option in this case is to just maintain what the patient has by implanting zero spherical aberration. We come to this one, which is abnormal RMS, but on account of spherical aberration. In this case, either the patient has a prior hypermetropic laser vision correction or prior myopic laser vision correction, or maybe the eyes are virgin and not operated. 
if we start with a prior hyperopic laser vision correction, we have to remember that the spherical aberration in this case is negative, um, as I showed you before. So either it is toxic, uh, negative spherical aberration. So in this case, we have to neutralize it uh, by positive spherical aberration, IOL, in order to push it to be non-toxic, uh, 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 non-toxic spherical aberration. Uh, and if the patient has non-toxic uh, negative spherical aberration and he cares about depth of focus, then we have to maintain this non-toxic spherical aberration. Otherwise, if image quality is critical to the patient, we have to neutralize it as well. Now we come to the prior myopic laser vision correction. In this case, the patient will have more positive, extra positive uh, spherical aberration. And um, they might be toxic spherical aberrations or non-toxic spherical aberration. If it was non-toxic spherical aberration, in this case, uh, uh, we depend on patient's demands. If, it is, uh, if the depth of focus is critical, then we have to maintain it as it is. We, we implant zero spherical aberration IOL. Uh, otherwise, if image quality is critical to the patient, we have to neutralize it by implanting a negative spherical aberration. And these are some examples. If the pre-op was a plus 0 0.6, then we, we should implant the highest uh, negative spherical aberration uh, IOL in order to uh, lower the spherical aberration as much as possible. This is another example. We implant the minus 0 0.27 as well. And um, uh, the, if it is uh, uh, plus 0 0.40, we will implant minus 0 0.27. So as you see, we have to choose the spherical aberration, the, the best spherical aberration IOL in order to uh, 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 neutralize it or uh, to push it to the target as much as possible. Now, if it was toxic uh, uh, positive spherical aberration, no way to uh, manipulate and we have to push it to the non-toxic uh, positive spherical aberration by neutralizing it. These are some examples. If it was plus 0 0.90, then minus uh, 0 0.27. If it was plus 0 0.80, minus 0 uh, 0.27, and so on. However, uh, uh, in some cases, we may implant the minus 0 0.20, and, uh, but it's better always to, to uh, to implant the highest um, uh, minus zero uh, minus um, a spherical aberration in order to uh, lower the positive spherical aberration as much as possible. We come to the virgin eye, uh, the non-toxic spherical aberration, um, depth of focus is, is critical, we maintain it. Otherwise, we have to neutralize it because in the virgin eyes, we know that the cornea has positive spherical aberration. And these are some examples. Um, if the virgin eyes very rarely has um, toxic spherical aberration, of course, we have to push it to be non-toxic uh, positive spherical aberration. And these are the examples. So this is a clinical example. I'll show you how we study the um, higher order aberrations. Actually, we have to uh, click on the N3. Uh, as you see here, the, the pyramid of uh, Zernike, we click on the N3. Uh, in order to activate the four high order aberrations, which are the vertical and horizontal comma, the vertical and horizontal trefoil, in addition to the spherical aberration in the N4, which is the middle. So these are the five high order aberrations that we have to study. Then we look at the RMS of those total uh, uh, high order aberrations. As you see, this is 0 0.34 microns, which is normal and the spherical aberration is 0 0.31. So it is normal. If the depth of focus is critical to the patient, we can uh, implant premium IOL. Otherwise, we can implant uh, minus um, a spherical aberration IOL in order to achieve the target. Uh, uh, in this case, because uh, the spherical aberration is plus 0 0.31, we can implant minus 0 0.20 in order to uh, achieve the target. Uh, this is the last example, clinical example number two. Uh, this is by Cyrus. Uh, as you see, the total is very high. It is 0 0.74, uh, while the spherical aberration is 0 0.20. So as we see that, the high order aberrations is on account of other high order aberrations, not on the account, account of the spherical aberration. So in this case, uh, we have to implant zero spherical aberration rather than 
implanting any other types um, to avoid uh, inducing more spherical aberrations. And thank you very much. And uh, actually, I'd like to announce about my two books, the fourth edition of Corneal Tomography in Clinical Practice and the third edition of Step-by-Step -step Reading Pentacam Tomography because they include in detail uh, this algorithm and other things as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mazen. It is very interesting also lecture. But I have uh, one question, Dr. Mazen. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, can I ask uh, how it, uh, how much this uh, new algorith algorithm uh, help us in practical life, in surgical life, in to choose the lens? I mean, if this lens with new choosing will help patient to more clear vision? Uh, yes, of course, uh, because if the patient has, uh, for example, high spherical aberration, it means that uh, the, uh, the patient has low quality of vision. And if we how, neutralize- how, how is that? How he, how he will feel that in uh, like what? Ah, um, contrast sensitivity. It means that uh, with um, low illumination, there will be blurring of vision, low illumination. Okay. Uh, uh, is that uh, uh, help for uh, night vision also? Yes, of course, yeah. Because as we know that spherical aberration affects night vision too much. Uh, the patient uh, suffers from halos uh, when the spherical aberration is high. So when we neutralize this spherical aberration, then he will have better uh, quality of vision, but he will lose the depth of focus. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you very much. It is very uh, interesting lecture. Thank you. Uh, now I want to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Yahya Name uh, uh, with the lecture uh, intra and post operative surprises of trifocal IOL surgery. Dr. Yahya, do you hear us? Dr. Yahya? Dr. Yahya? Victoria. Uh, yes, yes, it's, hello? Yes. Yes. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, now, good. Thank you. you can, can, can you hear me now? Start, please. Okay, may yes, I start? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my pleasure today to uh, share with you this talk about the intra and post operative surprises trifocal lenses uh, after this condensed and highly informative lecture of our mentor, Dr. Mazen Sinjab. Uh, let us refreshing uh, with, our, with some of the videos uh, that I'm going to present in this uh, talk. Uh, I have no financial interest. Actually, I'd like to present four cases, four surgical cases. First case, a 50-year-old patient complaining of decreased vision in both eyes. She had bilateral cataract and uh, she underwent myopic LASIK 15 years ago. Her best corrected visual acuity was 0.2 in both eyes. Uh, her cornea was clear with faint LASIK scar. Uh, uh, she had mild uh, myopic fundus degeneration with mild uh, posterior staphyloma. Her topography was okay with myopic ablation profile with high order, uh, high order ab uh, aberrations, about 0.8 micron. And uh, the myopic uh, uh, pupil was 0.5. Uh, the IOL calculation was uh, conducted uh, considering the uh, post lasik uh, calculation. But her care reading was uh, surprisingly uh, uh, 34 diopters in both eyes. Uh, the patient was informed about the possibility of further surgical enhancement in the presence of uh, residual refraction error, both operatively. Uh, the surgery was conducted in both eyes, FACO with trifocal lenses. Uh, but after surgery, uh, unfortunately, she had uh, minus three in one eye and, and minus uh, two in the fellow eye. Uh, she was willing to improve her distance vision more. 
Uh, my option was to implant sulcoflex in both eyes, as I cannot do further uh, laser vision correction because the carry ring reads uh, about 34. And uh, I, don't, I did not like to uh, do uh, IOL extraction and replacement with another trifocal lens. So the easiest uh, option for me was to do uh, 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 sulcoflex implantation in the sulcus. This is the uh, first uh, eye. The implantation of the sulcoflex was uneventful. Uh, as you see here, this is uh, the trifocal lenses implanted three months uh, earlier. And uh, this is the implantation of the lens, sulcoflex. I don't have any financial interest. Uh, Everything went un uneventfully. Now, centration of the lens and the uh, insertion of the hatex in the ciliary sulcus. It's very important to wash the uh, OVD and the viscoelastic in front and behind the lens, particularly the space between the two lenses in order not to elevate the intraocular pressure. And this is the conclusion of, of surgery. Now, regarding the other eye, here during implantation, I was shocked by the break of the, or the cut of the leading haptic. I'm trying to reposition the lens. And unfortunately, as you see here, the haptic is broken. The leading haptic is broken, while the trailing haptic is intact. So if you were in my situation, what do you suggest? Do you suggest uh, leave the lens, uh, the sulcoflex in place, and position the uh, trailing haptic in the sulcus inferiorly at 6 o'clock to support the lens? or extract the IOL, the uh, sulcoflex. What do you suggest? I will usually extract this IOL because it will have a sunset sooner or later. I cannot capture it in the bag because it will turn into a biggie bag. Technique, you will have uh, uh, some uh, uh, stealing from the anterior capsule that might migrate between the, the, the IOL interface. Actually, it's, it's difficult to uh, implant it in the bag because the bag already is closed uh, on, uh, around the, the trifocal lens. It's quite difficult to reopen the bag. So exactly this is what I did. I cut the lens. I suggest to remove. Yes. Remove this is what I did. One. Yes. Uh, I prefer to cut the lens with IOL cutter. and extract the lens piece by piece. This is the safest way not to refold the lens inside the anterior chamber. I prefer to cut it and extract the lens out of the eye. And I uh, <coughs> aborted the surgery for another session. Uh, what are the take home message from this case when considering uh, premium lens implantation, the trifocal toric, Adolf or sulcoflex, try to keep one lens as a backup lens, if possible, particularly for the first few cases, if you are not uh, uh, familiar with the new lenses like sulcoflex lens. The other one, uh, this patient, uh, the, the next case, uh, this is. Uh, uh, clearness extraction for a patient uh, willing to do refractive surgery, but he has uh, high hyperopia and astigmatism. Uh, I decided to do uh, a trifocal toric for him. Now, during the implantation of the lens, also I was shook by the following scenario. Here I'm implanting a blade haptic trifocal toric lens. You see, during the implantation, there was a fracture, 
small piece from the optic, but fortunately, it's, it was from the extreme periphery of, of the uh, optic of the IOL. Here, is it clear? It will be clear later on. Yes, clear, clear. Uh, since it's at the uh, extreme periphery. See, this is the piece of uh, the fracture from the uh, optic of the IOA. So in this situation, what do you suggest? Do you suggest to extract the IOA or to complete or do, to uh, go ahead and uh, implant the IOA in, in, in the back? What do you I suggest? Would I would definitely leave it because this is called addition of the IOL and you can leave it at the lateral side and it will really help the patient won't have a negative metamorphopsia post-op. So I would definitely keep it just making sure that the cut will stay at the lateral side of the eye. Lateral or nasal because of the... the, the no, no, I'll leave it at the, the lateral side, definitely the lateral side. Okay. Actually, this is what I have done. I uh, proceed in plantation of the lens, and uh, by the way, this lens should be directed on the uh, 90 degrees. So I rotate the lens to uh, position in the uh, appropriate uh, orientation. And this is the final outcome. By the way, this is the nasal, this is the left eye, and this is the uh, nasal aspect here, superiorly. And this is the crack of the optic. Fortunately, and luckily, it's in the extreme periphery of the optic. Uh, okay. After surgery, the uncorrected vision was 2020. And the lens was well centered in the capsular bag. Patient was quite satisfied after surgery. So, so uh, may I uh, have a question, Dr. Yahya? Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Omar said that uh, we will keep the um, cut edge uh, laterally while you kept it nasally. Which one is better? Yeah. Regardless, uh, regardless of the orientation, let's uh, uh, suppose that this is not a, not a toric lens. So which yes. one is better? The visual field is narrower from the nasal side comparing to the lateral side. So I think uh, if we keep it nasally, I think it's better to, because the visual uh, visuals, uh, field is narrower nasally, so I, I think it's better to keep it nasal. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I good. think that uh, there, there is a technique when patients are really suffering from negative metamorphopsia and they start seeing an edge from the periphery. Uh, there is a, a technique that you just go in and you truncate the lateral side of the lens and uh, patients are really doing with this uh, technique. Okay. So a uh, breaking small piece of the trifocal lens optic may not affect the final visual outcome if it, is, uh, in, if it involves the extreme periphery of the optic. This is what I have learned from this case. Doctor, I, I, my opinion is that is any side is, will not be a problem for the patient. Uh, I think like that. Particularly, the, uh, the affected area is in the extreme periphery. I think, uh, I think it doesn't matter either nasal or uh, temporal. Mm -hmm. So the, it is the third case, as you see here, this is a patient about 55 years old. Uh, she had uh, cortical cataract, as you see here. And she was willing to do a uh, FACO with trifocal lenses. Um, after removing the cortical material, sorry, after removing the nucleus, here I'm filling the bag with OVD. I have noticed that the bag is quite redundant. 
This is a very rare case, redundant capsular bag. I'll show you how much the redundancy of the capsular bag and uh, how much the redundant of the posterior capsule. Let us, let us see the uh, video. Uh, this is the stage of uh, removing the cortical material. Uh, I was quite cautious not to perforate the posterior capsule or to rupture the posterior capsule. You see how much the capsule is redundant here. You see the posterior capsule now? Is it clear? Yes, it's very clear, but I would have uh, stopped washing and putting a, a CTR. Uh, it will really reduce the risks of any rent in the posterior capsule. So in this situation, do you suggest to proceed with trifocal or perineum lens or just implant monofocal lens? What do you suggest? I would suggest a CTR and a premium IOL. CTR. CTR, if, if you have a good bag and good capsule, you can implant, but uh, I think a premium because uh, trifocal uh, lens, if it will not center, it will be disturb the patient. what's your point what? about the insertion of CTR? What's your point uh, about that? The CTR will Excuse keep me? the patient. Uh, when you have any, uh, any kind of... Uh, uh, problems with the anterior capsule or the posterior, or the whole bag, putting a CTR will uh, bring the shape back to its normal orientation. Do you think this uh, CTR will be effective in this uh, highly redundant posterior capsule? Uh, I guess so, but you would definitely need some cohesive viscoelastic while implantation. I have, after, after discussing with some friends about this uh, case, I have had uh, suggestion like your suggestion to put CTR and implantation. Okay, finally, I finished the case without any rupture of the posterior capsule. You see here, this is the last, you see how much the posterior capsule is redundant. Okay, I, I proceed with implantation of the trifocal lenses, lens without insertion of CTR. And just uh, uh, plate haptic lens. But it was a wrong decision. Although after surgery, the lens was uh, well centered, but there was uh, some faults uh, uh, on the space of the posterior capsule that make some blurring vision for the patient and the patient was not uh, satisfied after surgery. So after surgery and corrected visual acuity and best corrected visual acuity was 0 0.3, the lens was well centered. There was some capsular, uh, we capsular faults crossing the pupillary center. Almost there, the patient was in metrobia, but the patient was not satisfied. Uh, unfortunately, the, I lost uh, the connection with the patient. The patient did not come back to me after uh, some follow-up of surgery. Uh, 
So the take home message from this case, any abnormality in the capsular bag, like this case, a redundant capsular bag, is not a good, a good candidate for trifocal lens. The third case, uh, this is a patient with posterior subcapsular cataract. Uh, also, this little quickly because we have not time. Yes. Just one minute. Uh, after surgery, or uh, here, during the surgery, there was some uh, opacification of the posterior capsule of uh, the capsular bag. I tried to make polishing for the posterior capsule, but I couldn't remove this. Uh, uh, opacification, so I left it and I implanted the trifocal lens. Surgery was uneventful. You see this, some opacification that I couldn't uh, remove with uh, polishing of the posterior capsule. Finally, the trifocal was implanted. And after surgery, the best corrected, the uncorrected visual acuity, and also the corrected visual acuity wa wa was uh, 0 0.5, well central intracular lens, very mild posterior capsular uh, obesities. After three months, I diagnosed a capsule tumor for the patient, and the patient improved to uh, 2020, and he was uh, satisfied of the result. The take home message from this case any posterior subcapsular uh, uh, cataract surgery. Sorry. Uh, uh, any posterior subcapsular cataract may cause uh, some sticky cortical materials that don't go with uh, capsular polishing and may cause a higher effect uh, on the visual outcome with trifocal lenses comparing to monofocal uh, ones. And the patient should be informed that yard laser capsulotomy may be needed as early as three months after surgery. Thank you. That is a Dr. Yahya, what did you use for add-on lens for uh, circumflex to calculation? Sorry? In add-on, in first case. Yes. Which uh, add-on lens or uh, circumflex, how did you calculate? Which formula did you use? Yes, there is, there is a particular uh, uh, IOL calculator on the website of Rainer Lens. Uh, I think ray, ray trace or something like this. So you can uh, uh, look into the uh, uh, website of uh, Rainer and uh, you can enter the uh, data and the calculator of the Sarcoflex will give you the, uh, the IOL power. Okay. okay, okay, thank you. There is a question for Dr. Yahya maybe from the, some Dr. Youssef Alwan. Uh, couldn't you do IAG capsulotomy? Sorry, Yahya. Which case? Um, I don't know. Maybe yeah. he read, the third he did, one. He told the third one. He said third one. Couldn't you do a YAG capsulotomy? Uh, I, unfortunately, I lost the connection with the patient. The patient did not come to me. Uh, he just she came to me just two or three visits after surgery. But after uh, three months, she did not, I lost the connection with her. So uh, I uh, couldn't judge uh, exactly whether the YAG laser will be beneficial for her or not. Okay, thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yahya. Uh, now, Dr. Omar Marashi, corneal cabling. Please, Dr. Omar. Hello, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, corneal coupling, this is the new old emerging uh, technique. Um, just, just a second. Let me. I have no financial disclosures. Those are my references uh, from the American Academy of Ophthalmology and some schematics done by Dr. Udaya Devgan from UCLA. Um, we are all familiar with 
K and LRIs. We're not going to talk much about them because of the time limitation. All you have to do uh, is know the difference between both of them, uh, that the AKs are uh, done usually at 7 millimeter optical zone, approximately 600 micron depth or 50 microns less uh, than the thinnest pachymetry at the limbus or the limbal relaxing incisions where are done almost one millimeter away from uh, the limbus and uh, they are uh, done usually with this expensive guarded diamond blade that usually needs to go down to 95 percent of the corneal thickness. Uh, the uh, issue here is that you have to be an extremely trained surgeon just to make sure you make an arcuate cut not a straight cut and you have to go exactly on the axe. Uh, those are the schematics from Dr. Uday Devgan. If you look at the right side, you can see that the patient, uh, usually in uh, LRIs or uh, uh, AKs, uh, the deeper you go into the cornea, uh, the larger the effect. Meanwhile, on the left side, uh, the, when you use a FECO knife, uh, the, sh uh, the shorter the tunnel, the greater the flattening effect is. Now, this is a very uh, simple schematic showing you like a, a patient with one diopter of against the rule astigmatism with a FACO knife when you go uh, at uh, 100 80 degree, the degrees, uh, you uh, reduce uh, the astigmatism down to 0 0.5 diopters. So in the coupling technique, uh, you need only those instruments, a FACO knife, uh, um, uh, an axe ruler, an axe marker, uh, a tooth forceps, uh, a speculum and of course a marking pen. This is how the cornea looks with the marked steep meridian. Now this is a case I performed uh, four or five days ago just showing you uh, how I uh, are marking the steep meridian um, with this um, uh, corneal marker and I initiate the wound but I don't go fully into the, the core, uh, into the anterior chamber. I just make sure that the tip goes in. Then one millimeter away from it, I go parallel and I open another wound without inter uh, making the wounds intersect. Then if you've noticed here, I put some OVD because the anterior chamber shallowed. Uh, I am now changing the blade into a larger blade uh, just to make sure uh, that these uh, wounds are open. And uh, of course, this patient is phakic. And this concludes the operation. It's very simple and easy if you uh, fall on the white, uh, right plane. Now, this is the same, uh, this is a different patient, but this is from a nurse point of view. Uh, this is me marking the cornea. And uh, now I am gonna start, usually I start from the inferior uh, side. I do the inferior cut at one millimeter away from the limbus. Uh, I just, as you've seen, I've just opened the only the tip, the only the tip goes inside the anterior chamber. I don't go further. Just to make sure that the eye is still firm and my, my tunnel is initiated and I can complete it later. If you open the wood completely, you simply cannot do the, uh, the, uh, the, the second wound. Here, I change the blade uh, to a larger blade and I, and I go uh, uh, till the end, I open them till the end. If you've noticed, I open the lateral, uh, the peripheral ones first. This is the, uh, the first one. This is the uh, second one. Then I uh, uh, open the ones closer to the pupil. pupil. And that concludes the case. In this case, I did not need to put any OVD. So this is a patient of mixed astigmatism, just to show you uh, how the results went. He, uh, the patient prior to the surgery was uh, uh, had a plus 375 sphere, sphere over minus 475 at 11. The incisions were performed at 101, I meant like uh, on the steep meridian. Post-op, the patient was, uh, as you can see, uh, it, it turned from plus 375 over minus 475 
75 to plus one over minus 0 0.75. The patient's vision after 48 hours, you can see the dates up. Uh, after 48 hours, the, yeah, the vision was 2020. The patient was extremely satisfied. Now, this is a cross-section comparison between uh, the wounds of coupling and LRIs or AKs. If you've noticed here that the uh, on the right side, the uh, LRI or AK wound is full of uh, epithelium. It looks like a, it has a V-shape. Those wounds are usually weak and they stay weak for um, all of our life. A blunt trauma might make uh, a, a, this wound rupture. Meanwhile, on the left, uh, the strong adhesion wounds with the FACO knife, uh, this, this patient's uh, uh, wounds are so strong that you can perform a LASIK flap cut over them uh, after six months of the surgery. Uh, you have to put this in consideration. Uh, all of these are fake patients. Uh, every corrected one diopter of astigmatism with chorionic coupling corrects around a plus 0 0.5 diopters of hyperopia. Uh, so this procedure is cheap and easy. The procedure, uh, all you have to, all you need is a phaco blade and astigmatism, uh, astigmatism marker. Uh, you uh, will need, uh, it's, it's of course very easy to perform uh, for any phaco surgeon. Yeah, just make, you have to make sure you have to be very meticulous not to hit the crystalline lens or endothelium by mistake. You have to make sure that the eye is hard enough when you're initiating your wounds just to make sure you do not uh, enter the eye suddenly and cause any trouble. And of course, no, no, no stromal hydration is needed for the wound during the, uh, at the end of the procedure. Indications are patients with mixed uh, hyperopic astigmatism that they cannot have uh, refractive surgery and the amount of hyperopia is the half amount of astigmatism. Patients with prior PK or DALC uh, with substantial amount of astigmatism uh, and uh, the case are so different, uh, you have a very high difference in case that you cannot simply uh, perform LASIK treatment. Patients with ha which have a very flat K1 below 39 uh, de de degrees, the, I'm sorry, diopters, and you cannot, uh, you are uh, you are in a risk of uh, having any um, a buttonhole uh, if you use a manual keratome. And of course, patients with an isometropia and ambliopia and uh, have their ambliopic eye uh, with the same criteria uh, with astigma, uh, uh, hyperopia, almost a half amount of astigmatism. And we have noticed that the patients with those eyes after treatment gained at least one extra line at their best corrected visual acuity. You need always to correct the subjective axe if it differs from the topographic axe. This is your aim. Marking, of course, the 180 degree uh, first. We usually do that on the slit lamp because the patient in this case wouldn't have any uh, excyclotorsion. You have to make sure that you have to go uh, straight between uh, in the interpropillary uh, plane. You do a minute uh, abrasion at the 180 degrees and you, uh, no matter what the patient lays down, no matter how uh, how much the exacto torsion is, you can still compensate the difference. Now, this is a patient uh, who's 47 years old with a history of PK in her left eye. This case was uh, done by my friend in Russia. Uh, Dr. Vladimir consulted me like, what can I do in this case? This patient almost has almost nine diopters of astigmatism post up, and I really considered, uh, I, I encouraged him to consider corneal coupling. This is her uh, corneal, uh, this is her topography. If you can look at the lower uh, right uh, side, uh, you can see the cylinder is almost uh, nine degrees, uh, over nine degrees. This is the uh, very next day post op. The, um, there is substantial reduction of astigmatism, uh, which is almost four and a half diopters. Uh, this is uh, her astigmatism, uh, her topographic astigmatism which went below four diopters. And this is her uh, refraction post after six months, which is uh, uh, she has only two diopters of astigmatism left. He did a very clever thing that he made his um, Amaris uh, laser machine mark the astigmatism. Uh, instead of doing the astigmatism on the slit lamp, he used this uh, the iris uh, fingerprint, and uh, it was uh, it was a very precise surgery. Now, if you can notice here that the cylinder went below uh, two diopters of astigmatism. Now the patient is, uh, can undergo trans-PRK. Uh, uh, this is how he went. He, uh, he, he started the peripheral cuts. Then he went at, uh, at the medial cuts. I'm sorry, the, yeah, the medial cuts. They went 
is starting from the host and uh, ending up in the anterior chamber through the recipient cornea. Uh, some consideration points, the patient had a, a significant higher, a higher order aberration after coupling, <clears throat> but this is going to be considered um, put in consideration after uh, when she's going to undergo LASIK or surface ablation uh, after uh, the refraction stabilizes. What you have to know is the closer you get to the, uh, to the center, the stronger the effect is, uh, but it causes uh, more irregular astigmatism. So I don't usually go beyond eight or nine. Now I don't go beyond nine millimeters. So I, one wound goes at like uh, one millimeter into the cornea and the other wound goes parallel, another one millimeter into the cornea uh, and I make sure that they don't intersect. The wider the wound, the greater the effects, but the wood leaking should be put in consideration. Sometimes only one incision on each side would be adequate if the amount of astigmatism is not high. Suggested nomogram, uh, it's a, let's say it's a wild field here. All uh, We all know that a 3.2 millimeter uh, uh, opening at the limbus from every side will correct uh, 0 0.5 diopters of astigmatism. So if we go on both sides, we're correcting one diopter. Yet if the same 3.2 millimeter, if it goes two millimeters into the cornea, it uh, from both sides, it will correct 2.75 diopters of astigmatism. If we combine two cuts um, at the limbus and one two millimeter into the cornea, uh, we will get up, we will gain up to five diopters of a correction. Sometimes I combine a, a limbo 3.2 millimeter uh, and a 2.8, and that corrects almost four diopters of astigmatism. Those rules do not apply to post keratoplasty patients, where the second uh, wound that starts from the host and ends up into uh, the anterior chamber through the uh, uh, donor's cornea, uh, the amount of astigmatism corrected here is, is way higher. So in those cases, your aim is just to reduce the astigmatism. Conclusion, corneal coupling is a very useful, powerful, cheap technique that reduces, uh, reduces astigmatism of the patient and reduces their combined uh, hyperopia. And you hope to reduce astigmatism in post keratoplasty patients. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Dr. Anas. Father, Dr. Anas. يمكن إحنا الوقت داركنا ما بعرف إذا في شيء حدا بيحب في شيء أسئلة لكل السبيكرز من من البانلز. أنا عندي هون ما في أسئلة عن الشات ما بعرف. May I ask Dr. Omar please? Yes. Regarding the expectancy, the expectation of the, uh, the result after this coupling procedure, I think the downside of, in general, the LRI or uh, the coupling procedure, the it's unexpected. Uh, it has unexpected results. Uh, am I right? Uh, actually, if you're talking about LRIs, you are right. But when you're doing coupling, I've been performing this procedure uh, for the last five years. Uh, on almost uh, 350 cases. Uh, the amount of uh, reduction was, uh, wasn't, it did not exceed one and a half the optus of astigmatism in high ca higher cases. So what I do usually, I try to bit overcorrect the patient and usually they gain great results. Uh, if you're talking about LRIs and uh, AKs, yes, you are absolutely right because here you are going down uh, to a certain depth in the corner so sometimes if you go to 80% or if you sometimes have some uh, irregular healing of the wound, you will have irregular astigmatism and you will lose the effect. But this is 100% uh, depth. It goes straight into the cornea. Uh, you can get this from your phaco patients. Uh, if you perform uh, this uh, procedure, you've not you notice uh, during the, uh, the patient's lifetime, the, the results are stable. What about the long-term effect? Uh, yeah, I'm talking. I'm telling you, I've, I have a, I have almost 350 patients for the last five years. Does it preserve the same effect after a few months? Yeah. 
is yeah, if, yeah well, I told you you have to over over correct a little bit at the beginning and you have to uh, put the patient in the expectation that some uh, under correction might happen or some regression might happen but usually patients are doing so fine now I'm, I'm, I'm going to patients which are 17 and 16 years old uh, who have a very low a case uh, and I'm telling them that they we do this operation right now and when they are 18 years old uh, their case stabilizes up to four and then we can uh, initiate a LASIK flap. Okay. Okay. So please, Dr. Hale. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another question to Omar uh, from uh, somebody. Do you prefer it over corneal wedge? Uh, I did not answer. I did not understand the question. Uh, how do I prefer it over a corneal wedge? I did not get it. What does he mean That's, by corneal? Uh, do you prefer it this uh, coupling over corneal wedge? Oh, of course, definitely yes. It's it's uh, very safe uh, and uh, uh, the results are, are are amazing. I've been I've done all um, uh, three hundred almost three hundred and fifty cases with wonderful results. Which it's, 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 in your fast, fast, it's a fast, easy, cheap oh, technique fast. and it uh, with a very high effect, especially with keratoplasty, post keratoplasty patients. Mm -hmm. Is there any question for Dr. Amar? I think no more. So Dr. Ram is uh, finished the time. Dr. Ram is. I think there's a connection issue, Dr. Ramos. Okay, I think uh, finish. Uh, the time is uh, over and uh, everything. Uh, okay, it is many, many thanks for everybody from you, for all speakers. It was very good uh, uh, webinar for us, for Syrian society. I think uh, for us in the future, it will be help us more and we will do more like that. Thank you for everybody in this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.